Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, C'est le, le fun de vous voir en grand nombre. Uh, it's nice to see you all in big numbers. Uh, we're just letting people in at the moment. The, the, it will start around one o'clock. If you have any questions, si vous avez des questions plus techniques et ces choses-là, mettez-les dans, dans, dans le chat et on va vous répondre. Donc, Alexandra, Alexandre Vadenet, aucun problème. Je pense que Jessica a, a pourra te répondre aux questions pour t'aider là-dessus. Je lis Soleil, il y a déjà... Oui? qui nous pose une question euh, technique. Euh... Oui, Jessica s'en occupe en ce moment. Oui. Je vais lui répondre, je suis en train de lui répondre. Oui, oui. On, part... okay. On partage le même chat. Oui, même... toutes les panélistes ensemble ici, ouais, vous, on, on l'a tout. Public. Il est public, oui. Oui, parce qu'il y a quelqu'un du public qui a écrit. OK, je comprends. Exactement. Attendez, c'est pour répondre à tout le monde, tout le monde. Oui, exactement. Tu peux exact. aussi parler « privately so », tu peux choisir à qui tu veux parler dans le bas, le, dans le chat. J'ai déjà contacté Jaime. Bon, euh... ben voilà. <rire> Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're just settling in. We're letting people in uh, into the, the, the webinar. Uh, we're expecting a, a couple of hundred people. So, we're waiting for people to sign in and get in. And if you have any questions, vous avez des questions au niveau de la technologie ou quoi que ce soit, ou des questions plus particulières dans ce sens-là, euh, vous pouvez le mettre dans le chat, puis on a Jessica qui peut vous répondre en français. And we have Shay that can answer you in English for any technical questions and anything like that. So don't hesitate, we're there for you to, have, to, to be able to start well uh, this, um, this webinar. So a question here was asked, uh, uh, you, you, your cameras and your, and your microphones are uh, set to, to not uh, be able to, to speak or is that, so nobody, we can't hear you. Uh, if, you're, if at a point you want to ask a question, you have to lift your hand up, levez votre main si vous voulez parler, puis on va aller vous chercher, puis on va vous amener comme panéliste, là, vous allez pouvoir poser votre question. You will be able to ask your question only if I bring you into the panelist side. Or unless, if you have another question, just write it in the chat and we'll come and help you. Donc, bonjour à vous tous. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're letting people in. We had about almost 500 people sign up. So we're at 100 at the moment. So we'll just let uh, another couple of minutes uh, to let people come in and settle in. So, um, and uh, Jessica and uh, Shay will be answering certain technical questions. One of them that's keep, that keeps on popping up, we can't hear you. Uh, and we can't see you at the moment because we're in the webinar uh, Zoom instead of the meeting Zoom. Uh, and if you want to talk, you can uh, lift your hand. So I have Chantal here, and then I'm going to promote to panelist. And did that work? We're testing it out. Bonjour, Chantal. Est-ce que tu peux oh, ask to unmute? Do I have to unmute her? She also has to unmute herself. Ah, uh, faut que tu te démute. No. Allô, Chantal? Ça n'a pas de l'air à marcher. Je pense que tu dois lui faire euh, réactiver le micro. Attends. 
Si tu vas sur sa fenêtre, il y a trois petits points. Oui, non, je sais, mais je ne suis pas capable de la faire. J'arrive pas à la unmuter. I can make her as a co-host and then she can talk. But then I, I she'll, will she be stuck here? I don't know. C'est peut-être elle qui a... Hey, Chantal, oui, bonjour. Tu avais une question? Ah, on ne t'entend pas, tu es toujours sur mute. OK, ben là, il faut... Ah, bonjour. Oui, je, je sais, je suis sur mute, allô? OK. Je ne comprenais pas tantôt parce que je ne me voyais pas à l'écran. Ah non, c'est ça, mais vous ne verrez pas parce que vous allez rester là-bas puis personne ne se voit. Ah, OK. Super. Comme... Alors, je referme mon, mon, mon micro. C'est bon. So là, how do I... Shay, how do I put her... Assign, ask to unmute, stop, read name, spotlight, make host, co-host, don't... Remove. Do I read... Is that what I do? I remove her? Yeah, and she goes back to the other place. Okay, good. I don't want to delete her. <laughs> Bon, bonjour tout le monde, on s'excuse, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we're still letting people in, there's still a lot of people coming in, so I will give another minute, uh, we're at 164, we had 481 people sign up today, since uh, a couple of weeks, so we'll let people come in, bonjour tout le monde, uh, il reste encore quelques personnes, je vais garder une petite minute avant de commencer, uh, on avait 481 personnes qui étaient inscrit aujourd'hui. On est rendu à près de 167. On va attendre quelques minutes et on va partir le webinaire et les gens arriveront euh, un après l'autre. Donc, je vais commencer. I'm going to start. Bonjour, hello, hola. I will be the moderator for this conference today. Je serai votre animatrice pour la conférence d'aujourd'hui. I'm Julie Soleil Meeson and I work with l'Association des intervenants en dépendance du Québec. I will hand off to Sophie, who is doing simultaneous interpretation today. She will explain how this works for all. Je vous présente Sophie qui vous s'occupera de la traduction simultanée et vous expliquera comment ça fonctionne. Sophie, c'est à toi. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everyone. Um, I will start in French and then I'll repeat in English. Um, alors, moi je suis ici pour offrir l'interprétation simultanée. On va avoir des présentations en anglais et en français aujourd'hui pendant le webinaire. Um, donc, on vous suggère, si vous en avez besoin, d'activer l'interprétation simultanée qui est offerte à l'écrit. Euh, vous pouvez faire ça en cliquant sur CC sous-titres en bas de votre écran euh, si vous êtes sur, sur un ordinateur. Euh, ça, ça va vous permettre d'activer les sous-titres, c'est-à-dire de voir euh, l'interprétation qui défile en bas de l'écran. Euh, et on vous suggère également d'ouvrir euh, la transcription intégrale qui vous permet alors de voir toute la transcription euh, dans, euh, dans sa version complète. Alors, euh, idéalement, vous pouvez suivre les deux si vous en avez besoin. Je vais faire mon possible pour euh, euh, transmettre ce qui se dit. Euh, si jamais vous voulez poser des questions aussi, vous pouvez, vous pouvez le faire dans la langue de votre choix. Puis on, est, on a une, une belle équipe multilingue ici pour vous appuyer. Alors, vous pouvez participer dans la langue de votre choix. Si jamais vous êtes sur un, ordi, euh, si vous êtes sur un téléphone ou une tablette, il euh, faut rentrer dans vos paramètres sur euh, Zoom pour activer les sous-titres. Alors voilà, bonne rencontre. Um, in English, uh, hi everyone, I'm providing uh, simultaneous interpretation today. Uh, we're going to have presentations in uh, French and in English. So um, if you need it, uh, please uh, use the simultaneous interpretation. It's provided in written form. Um, you can activate it by clicking on CC subtitles at the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop. Um, this will allow you to activate the subtitles, so to see the interpretation um, live um, at the bottom of your screen. And we also suggest that you um, open the uh, full transcription as well, so you can see the full transcript. Um, you can, if you're on a tablet or a phone, then you can activate the closed captioning in your settings. 
Um, and feel free to ask uh, questions in the language of your choice. And we have a multilingual team, so we'll be, make sure that uh, everyone is able to understand one another. So um, have a great meeting. Merci. Ah, merci beaucoup, Sophie. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sophie. So I, I am talking to you from my home in the Eastern Townships, uh, which, is the which is the land I, pl I play, live and work, is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki people and the Webenaki Confederacy. I also recognize that Quebec has more than 50 communities in, on its territory and also the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities whose traces have marked these lands for generations. I've been inspired by my partners, uh, Sanzia and Sandra, that have written something I believe needs to be said here. In Canada and Quebec, uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have experienced a huge in increase in overdoses. I would like to take the time to mention that drugs were first criminalized in Canada to silence Indigenous people, and that it remains a tool till today to oppress them. Prejudice against Indigenous people leads to threat tragedies like the death of Joyce Eshwakan. Sometimes we refuse to give drugs or to treat indigenous people because we assume they are only looking for drugs. Sometimes we over medicate because we want to silence them. Sometimes the symptoms are ignored because it is assumed that they are under the influence of drugs and alcohol. It's the same system that sends that sent executioners to Joyce rather than caregivers. Recognizing unceded territory is also for us to recognize violent acts and horrendous consequences to the indigenous populations of Canada. It is important to recognize that systemic racism does not mean that we, were, we are all racist. This means that the system does not take into account the realities of minorities and it per perpetuates discrimination within institutions. The system must be reviewed and recreated for a more fair, representative and inclusive for joyous and for all Indigenous people. I would also like to take a couple of seconds of silence to think about all the people we have lost in the last couple of years. So I, I welcome you today uh, for this uh, for this uh, webinar that's going to be on decriminalization of all substances. Uh, and many of you have signed up uh, for this topic, and it's not an easy topic, also. So sometimes we have certain things that we need to say uh, regarding this. One of the things I have to start out before we start the whole um, uh, thing is to talk about all the housekeeping and the little things that we need to know before. Uh, beforehand, uh, so everybody is on the same uh, same page. So patience, kindness, and humor. Uh, this Shay is your is your little piece, but I like using it because it's quite good. Bringing people together to meet and engage in new ways and with sometimes unstable technology will not be without its hiccups. Digitally mediated activities already put distance between us. Please join us in creating a safe space. Some, piece, some pieces to note, I think Sophie has told you, everybody, closed captioning, if it's in English, it will be in English and French, so make sure that you, you, you will have that so you can have your simultaneous uh, interpretation. We are using the hashtag, hashtag decriminalization with the Z and not the S for this, uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, questions for the panelists in the Q&A, and then other questions, chat, uh, technology or other things in the chat. Uh, Shay will be taking care of the English side, Jessica, the Francophone, and there's Vanessa also that's there to help out. So we have a couple of tech people on board to help us out today. Um, tuk, 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 tuk. Uh, I always take a, a, a second also to thank all the people that have been working in the back in the background uh, to make this happen because usually we never have time at the end to say this. So thank you to Marilyn, Vanessa, Peter, Jessica, Shay, and Sophie for helping out on every aspect of making this a smooth ride. 
in partnership with CAPUD and CDPC, has grown Stimulus as being a project with many different aspects to it. Most of you already know Stimulus Connect and the Hangouts. Stimulus Webinar is the new addition to Stimulus. We are reaching out to a broader population and the webinars are to set the table on complex issues and give you more information on different concepts. We would like to welcome everybody who that has signed up for this event. Some fast statistics before we get into the VIF of the subject. We have 481 people who have signed up from across the country. 73% of you are women. We have people from all professions, from outreach to peers, to managers who work in community organizations, to researchers, students, professors, teachers, nurses, doctors, and pharmacists, to probation officers, lawyers, social workers, policy makers, and government workers. We have about 56% of you that come from Quebec, 15 from BC, 14 from Ontario, and 7% from Manitoba, but we have people from across the territories and all the other provinces that are there also. And we would like to say hello to some of the, our friends from abroad, uh, from Wales, Ukraine, England, the USA and Mexico that are also here. With all of you today, we will have some great presentation and hopefully some interaction at the end with all the questions you will have. I will now give the speakers a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and then each of them will present an aspect regarding decriminalization. All the PowerPoints and the recordings that are here, we've recorded it, so the PowerPoints that you're going to see are all going to be on the webinar. Uh, I think Shay has, uh, has uh, shared them and Jessica also, uh, the, the stimulus conference webinars, you'll have all of that in the next week, the recordings and the PowerPoints. So now it's up to the, the, the speakers, and I will uh, let uh, Guillermo uh, be the first person to present himself. Hello, mon nom, uh, bienvenue tout le monde. Merci beaucoup, Julie Soleil. Mon nom est Guillermo Oriano. Je suis chercheur associé au Cérium à l'Université de Montréal. Merci, Guillermo. Uh, Sandra? Or Sandra, uh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Julie Soleil. I'm Sandra Kahanchu. Uh, I'm a lawyer and the director of research and advocacy at the HIV Legal Network, formerly the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. Um, I'm based in Toronto, the traditional treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Wendat. And I'm really excited to talk to you today. Thank you, Sandra. Jaime? Hi, everybody. My name is Jaime Redondo. I'm a professor of drug policy, uh, the drug policy program at CIDE in the city of Aguascalientes, Mexico. And I'm also a researcher at the BCCSU in Vancouver. And I'm talking right now from Tijuana, the unceded traditional territory of the Kumai people, and now populated by many marginalized populations like deportees and migrants, and happy to be here. Thank you, Jaime. Emily? Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Emily Grants. I work with Rain City Housing in Vancouver's downtown east side. Um, I'm speaking to you day, today from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Thank you, Emily. So thank you for your lovely introductions. I love it. It was short, so then we can get right into the, the subject. So the first person that's going to lead uh, the discussion is going to be Guillermo. So Guillermo, if you want to share your PowerPoint, so give him a couple of seconds so he can share it, and then he will start talking. Sure. Hello. His presentation will be in French. Alors, voici ma présentation pour la journée. Euh, si vous, euh, on, il y a une série de questions qui est euh, après, une, euh, et autrement, vous pouvez demander mon courriel et me contacter. Alors, je vais commencer cette présentation qui est un bref historique et quelques rappels importants sur le débat concernant la décriminalisation par euh, tout simplement un rappel du fait que la décriminalisation a été dans le temps long de l'histoire la norme et la prohibition internationale, la prohibition mur à mur que nous connaissons, c'est une exception. C'est une petite période qui a commencé il y a un peu moins de 60 ans. Ça peut paraître étonnant, mais la prohibition est une décision politique, ce n'est pas un phénomène naturel. 
et c'est une décision politique récente. En Occident, il y a eu plusieurs processus de décriminalisation, autant dans des pays démocratiques et dans des pays autoritaires. Ça peut surprendre, mais oui, il y a des pays autoritaires où il y a eu des processus de décriminalisation. Aujourd'hui, dans le monde, il y aurait à peu près une trentaine de euh, projets de décriminalisation en cours des très différents tacabis. Mais le modèle de la décriminalisation, on en entend beaucoup parler depuis à peu près une vingtaine d'années, c'est sans doute le Portugal. Toutefois, il faut dire que le Portugal ne s'est pas contenté juste de décriminaliser la possession de petites quantités de toutes les drogues, mais en même temps, le Portugal a entamé un processus très vaste de réforme de toutes les institutions de services de première ligne. Ils ont mis sur pied un réseau de prévention très étendu, de réduction des risques, de traitements et de réinsertion. Aucune des instances, même si sur papier ça peut avoir l'air d'être des instances répressives, ce sont toutes des instances, des groupes, de, de, j'insiste, de première ligne qui font plus dans l'information et l'accompagnement que euh, dans une logique de répression. Et il faut comprendre aussi que le contexte de révision générale des politiques sociales a été très vaste, incluant le revenu, un revenu social et également les questions d'habitation, de faciliter l'accès au logement. Il y a des leçons importantes sur le Portugal. Sûrement, vous avez déjà parcouru différents rapports sur le cas portugais. Il y a des grands débats, autant au niveau de, euh, universitaire qu'au niveau journalistique et de l'opinion publique. Mais je crois qu'il y a deux principales leçons à tirer du cas du Portugal. La première leçon, surtout si l'on compare avec plusieurs autres euh, expériences de décriminalisation, c'est que la décriminalisation en elle-même, la décriminalisation per se, n'est pas la solution. Ce qui a marché dans le cas du Portugal, c'est la reconstruction des liens sociaux. C'est la reconstruction des liens sociaux des usagers qui fait la différence et non pas le fait que le statut euh, des euh, drogues des, des, qui sont consommées dans la rue par les gens les plus marginalisés vient à changer. Une autre leçon très importante considérant le débat qui s'en vient peut-être au Canada, c'est que dans le cas du Portugal, comme dans tous les autres pays où il y a eu différentes tentatives de décriminalisation, ces politiques n'ont pas produit ni un chaos social, ni une augmentation absolument incroyable des consommations, comme on a aussi souvent très, très peur. Ce n'est pas arrivé. Euh, il faut, euh, je pense, être conscient dans le cadre de ce webinaire si euh, on se fie un peu à l'expérience pour la légalisation de la marijuana, même si c'est maintenant une bataille différente qui s'annonce, qu'elle va être très longue et tumultueuse. Il faut dire également que les partisans avoués euh, qui vont au front et ceux très discrets qui restent en coulisses, mais qui travaillent tous les jours, qui défendent les statu quo, qui défendent la prohibition, ils ont des moyens considérables. Ils ont des moyens autant institutionnels que symboliques. C'est pourquoi on a pu dire tout et n'importe quoi sur la légalisation du cannabis et nous promettre un véritable enfer sur terre que, comme vous le savez, ne s'est pas produit. Alors, considérant cette expérience et peut-être sûrement plusieurs d'entre vous ont participé à, aux différentes instances de consultation ou même des préparations des lois et règlements. Vous vous souvenez, vous avez déjà une expérience. C'est à partir de cette expérience que nous avons eue récemment au Canada que je crois important au niveau de, du débat que nous allons avoir dans le pays par rapport à la décriminalisation de toutes les drogues, qu'il y a quatre rappels qui sont très importants à faire. La première chose, 
dont il faut se rappeler, ce sont les origines d'inspiration religieuse et raciste de la prohibition. Ils ne sont pas toujours expliqués. Et ces, ces origines ont donné des valeurs, des automatismes, j'insiste sur le mot automatisme, sur des réflexes de pensée qui viennent naturellement et qui sont d'inspiration religieuse et raciste et qui ont une très, très grande prégnance. On peut l'entendre très facilement si vous allez parcourir les débats qu'il y ont qu eu dernièrement sur les radios publiques au Canada. Et des fois, on n'y pense pas, mais on est en train de se rabattre sur ces préjugés. Les valeurs d'inspiration religieuse et raciste qui sont à la base de la prohibition sont très simples. L'abstinence équivaut au salut. La consommation, c'est une sorte d'état individuel et danger social. Et tout le débat est en quelque sorte promu, fondé sur des valeurs de paternalisme et de discrimination envers certains groupes sociaux avec des gens d'une certaine origine ethnique. Vous pouvez le voir de façon très claire aux origines de la prohibition qui a visé tout d'abord les lois prohibitionnistes, certaines minorités ethniques ou certains pays en particulier. Si besoin en est, je reviendrai sur des exemples concrets plus tard. Ce qui m'intéresse ici de surligner, c'est le fait que ces valeurs d'inspiration religieuse et raciste sont aujourd'hui encore très palpables quand des experts discutent de la décriminalisation de toutes les drogues, même si ces valeurs ne sont pas explicites. En quelque sorte, elles percolent partout dans la discussion. J'aimerais également que nous nous rappelions tous, quand nous débattons de la décriminalisation, que la prohibition a eu des effets absolument néfastes, surtout au niveau de la punition des usagers et des petits trafiquants. Les taux d'incarcération sont absolument énormes et disproportionnés, surtout pour des minorités, et ça varie de pays en pays. L'accès aux services de santé, là où il y a des services de santé, devient extrêmement difficile pour des gens qui sont des usagers, mais qui cumulent un grand nombre d'handicaps sociaux. Et l'exclusion fonctionne toujours comme une sorte de cercle vicieux qui va en s'empirant. La décriminalisation peut éventuellement contribuer à rompre ce cercle vicieux. Mais il ne faut pas oublier que c'est un des effets majeur des politiques prohibitionnistes. Une chose très importante dans tout ce débat que le docteur Karl Hart a mis de l'avant, comme d'autres avant lui, c'est que nous voyons partout et très souvent dans les débats et dans les pratiques quotidiennes d'experts et de beaucoup d'intervenants, une tendance à infantiliser les usagers et la question est très difficile parce qu'elle est peu abordée, insuffisamment abordée. Et il faut reconnaître également que beaucoup d'usagers ont internalisé ce discours invalidant et agissent en conséquence. Donc, il n'y a rien de facile ici, mais une longue bataille qui s'annonce. Et justement, pour faire front à l'infantilisation, nous avons un exemple très concret et celui de la normalisatie à la néerlandaise qui n'a pas le sens péjoratif du terme normalisation en français ou en anglais. Tout simplement, normalisatie veut dire mettre de l'avant, mettre en pratique des discours et des pratiques concrètes d'intervention et d'aide qui partent du principe de l'autonomie et de la responsabilisation des usagers, de la responsabilisation citoyenne des usagers, de leur intégration dans une société « normale ». En néerlandais, peut-être ça sonne mieux qu'en français. Alors, voilà pour l'essentiel de ma présentation. Peut-être j'ai été trop rapide, mais j'avais le souci d'être beaucoup trop long. Alors, euh, voilà, Julie Soleil, je passe la parole au conférencier suivant. 
Mais merci beaucoup, Guillermo. Euh, très, très, très bien. Euh, C'est toujours bien. On va avoir plus de temps pour les questions à la fin. Euh, et je vais pas... Donc, il euh, faudrait que tu arrêtes le partage de ton écran pour que Sandra puisse euh, faire son partage. So, Sandra, it's your turn. You can share your screen. Thank you. Um, Julie Soleil and Guillermo. So as I mentioned, my name is Sandra Kahan Chu and I'm with the HIV Legal Network. And what I'm going to do today is provide a bit of a snapshot of what the law is in Canada, um, some of the outcomes of criminalization of simple drug possession in Canada and, and maybe some developments in the last few months and also where might we go from here. So um, here I have a picture of some protests, uh, a couple of them during International Overdose Awareness Day, um, protesting the government's drug policy in Canada, um, and uh, we can talk about what that means. In, in Canada, it's a federal law that governs um, how controlled substances are regulated. It's called the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And section four of that law, as you can see on the screen, prohibits the possession for personal use of substances and um, the punishments range from a fine to a term of imprisonment up to seven years. And how that's sort of uh, dealt with in the courts or by prosecutors is depends on the substance whether it's a first or second offense, some of the circumstances uh, relating to the possession. So um, this is the law that governs simple drug possession, meaning possession for personal use. How has that played out in the last few years? Um, in Canada, there were 83,483 drug arrests in 2018 alone, and more than 55,000 of them were for simple drug possession. Um, over a five-year period, that's about 72% of all drug arrests, they're for simple drug possession. And so when we talk about drug offenses, um, there is often the, the sense that we're trying to uh, capture big time drug traffickers or drug sellers, um, but the majority of drug arrests continue to be for simple drug possession. And you can see over a five year period in that uh, yellow screen, there are 470,000 drug arrests over a five year period. Who is most affected by these drug laws? In Canada, it's black and indigenous communities. And so we have information from a number of different freedom of information requests and research studies. Um, we know that in Toronto, for instance, black people with no history of criminal conviction, convictions are three times more likely to be arrested for cannabis possession than white people with similar backgrounds. Guillermo touched on this in his presentation as well. We see that in a study of uh, cities across Canada, black and indigenous people are overrepresented in cannabis possession arrests. Um, I'm not gonna go through the statistics, but you can see them there. Um, these are not old numbers. These are numbers that come from the last decade or so. Um, not only in terms of the drug arrests, but in terms of people who are serving a sentence for a drug offense. In the federal prison system where people serve a sentence of two plus years, almost 20% of black federal prisoners are incarcerated for a drug related offense. And that number is even more disproportionate for black women in federal prisons. They're more than two times likely to serve a sentence for a drug related offense as their male counterparts and um, Indigenous and Black women are more likely than white women to be in prison for that reason. And this is a number from 2017. And we, we, there's no reason to think that the numbers are any different today. What are the costs of enforcing the drug laws? So we don't have any um, research about the cost of enforcing simple drug possession, but we do know uh, the cost of drug offenses as a whole, based on research from CICER and the CCSA, more than $6.4 billion of policing courts and correctional costs in 2017 could be attributed to the use of criminalized substances. And that includes not only the cost of enforcing the drug laws, but also what the, the research studies uh, describes as the impact of crimes that would, not have occurred with, that would not have occurred without some substance use. And that was based on um, interviews of people who use substances who are in incarcerated and they, they disclosed um, whether or not substance use had an impact on whether or not they're, they're incarcerated for that, um, in, for their incarceration. So you see, it's not a single out simple drug possession, but does provide an idea of the colossal financial burden of continuing to enforce drug offenses in the criminal legal system. And we know from research around the world where they have decriminalized that there has been direct savings to the criminal justice system when you do remove that sanction. So what do the federal government parties say? Um, we, um, the HIV Legal Network where I work, sent out a questionnaire back in 2019 when there was a federal election. And we, we wanted a survey of the federal party's positions on drug decriminalization. So we heard from the NDP and the Green Party uh, that they would decriminalize. That was uh, what they shared with us at the time. 
the Liberal Party um, has said that rather than pursuing decriminalization, which is not a silver bullet, and that's something they use a lot, the, the terminology of silver bullet, we're focusing on a safe supply. Um, no one just said it was a silver bullet. I think Guillermo pointed that out. Um, no one has said decriminalization is a silver bullet, but it's a very necessary step to address some of the harms of uh, continuing to wage a war on people who use drugs. And some developments in the last year or so. We know that a member of parliament, a federal member of parliament in Toronto put forward two private members bills early this year um, that moved towards decriminalization. And they were not, they didn't actually die in the order paper when we prorogued. So they're part of the, the, the legislative agenda still. The first is Bill C-235, which includes a straight repeal of section four of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And that was the section I mentioned earlier that is that sanctions simple drug possession. A second bill, Bill C-236, what is uh, called evidence-based diversion measures requires offers to consider measures other than judicial proceedings to deal with individuals who are alleged to possess drugs for personal use. And these are um, to take no further action, provide a warning or refer someone to a program agency or other service provider that may assist the individual. So there's two sort of formulations of uh, a law reform that would move us towards decriminalization. One, removing the law altogether that criminalizes simple drug possession and the other, um, taking some actions to divert people away from the criminal legal system. We also know that earlier in the summer, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police issued a report, um, decriminalization for simple possession, exploring impacts on public safety and police, policing. So the report was quite a profound development from the police um, because it does recognize substance use disorder as a public health issue. It also noted the evidence that uh, decriminalization uh, is not an effective is it is an effective way to reduce the public health and public safety harms associated with substance use, and endorses alternatives to criminal sanctions. So that was quite a monumental um, development that happened over the summer. And what was the response to this report? Uh, police forces across the country um, came out in 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 support of this CACP report. And here's just an overview of some of them. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. This was a look at the media um, reporting of the different police services across Canada that said, we endorse this uh, report. In response, the federal health minister also um, came out with uh, this particular quote. And we know her background in harm reduction, Minister Haidu. She said, you know, having been a person who worked in drug policy for a long time, I can tell you when you have the support of enforcement to take the next steps, or firm what you're doing, I think that's very important. And she also said she was excited to explore all possibilities to reduce the criminalization of people who use substances. Shortly after, we had a BC Premier, uh, BC, John, BC Premier John Horgan, um, also acknowledging that criminal prohibitions are ineffective in deterring drug use and criminalization of drug possession leads to more stigma and discrimination and calling on the federal government to make the necessary changes to section four of the CDSA. So they put the onus back on the federal government to amend the law, um, but showing their support for decriminalization at the time. Also, um, not only did the police services across the country endorse CACP report, but we also heard from health authorities across country. And some of these preceded the report. These are, some of them are longstanding calls for decriminalization. We see here from coast to coast, a number of health authorities calling on the federal government to decriminalize or endorsing the um, decriminalization. And most recently, we heard, we heard from Dr. Theresa Tam, Canada's chief public health officer. She didn't say go so far as to say I endorse decriminalization, but she said we need to move towards a societal discussion on decriminalization. That only happened two months ago. But again, uh, what did we hear from the federal government and the um, prime minister in particular? Um, his response, um, which came out last month, is was that there's not one silver bullet um, and it's much more of a health issue rather than a justice issue. So again, no commitment to decriminalizing simple drug possession. Um, and uh, I think more of a focus on safe supply. So what does decriminalization mean? There have been a lot of different uh, definitions of decriminalization thrown out and, and I wanted to walk us quickly through some of them. In the CACP report, there are still sanctions um, being advocated for including potentially a fine or other type of sanction. There was strong language about criminal penalties still applicable to manufacturers, dealers, and traffickers. And the police would continue to play a key role in diverting people to 
what they called substance use disorder treatment and other social support services. And the frontline officers would be the first point of contact. So their role is not necessarily shrunken in this model. Um, the police continue to play a role in diversion and issuing fines or another type of sanction. We also know there was a, a Public Prosecution Service of Canada directive that happened in August, 2020, another major development. And the Public Prosecution Service of Canada is responsible for sort of it, for issuing guidelines in some contexts for how the prosecutors um, pursue certain offenses. And the PPSC, as a shorthand, is responsible for pursuing drug offenses in most of the provinces with a couple of exceptions. And so um, they directed prosecutors to focus on the most serious cases raising public safety concerns. And they also acknowledged, like the CACP report, that criminal sanctions have limited effectiveness and in fact can cause more harm. How do they define the most serious manifestations of harm? Here are some of the bullet points, um, the bullet points that sort of they define in their directive or their guideline. If it poses a risk to safety or well-being of children, if it risks health or safety of others, um, risk of communities efforts to address consumption of controlled substances in accordance with own community approaches, which is for, it was a little vague. We don't, I don't understand what that, that bullet point actually means in practice. If it's associated with another offense, if it happens in jail or penitentiary, or if it's committed by a peace officer or public officer were relevant to the discharge of their duties. Those are considered serious manifestations of the offense. And so therefore in those cases, um, the prosecutors would be justifying going ahead with a charge. In other countries, what has decriminalization meant? We're gonna hear a bit more uh, from the subsequent speaker, speaker about Mexico, but we know that for instance in Russia, where they've specified small quantities of various substances uh, to decriminalize for personal possession, there's no crime, but it still means you can get an administrative offense. And when we have to think back about what the CACP report said about administrative offense, a penalty or fine, what can happen? It could lead to something called net widening where more people are actually caught in the net when it's not a criminal offense, but perhaps an administrative offense. And we know that's the case in Russia. In Portugal, which was discussed earlier, the possession threshold is 10 days average individual consumption. What else could decriminalization mean? Um, we could also discuss decriminalizing small scale trafficking for a number of really good reasons, including the fact that sharing a small quantity should not be criminalized. It's not uncommon that many people who, who, who use drugs may engage in drug selling um, as a means of livelihood and potentially to support their own use. And is it the best use of resources? We saw that even though the majority of drug arrests are for possession, a, a number of arrests are also for trafficking. And that is also disproportionately applied to racialized communities in Canada. So is that a good use of resources to, to continue to criminalize small scale trafficking? If we were to decriminalize in Canada, how would we get there? Uh, we, there are some court decisions around the world that have deemed bans or criminal prohibitions on drug consumption for personal use as unconstitutional. Um, Mexico, Chile, Spain, Colombia, and Argentina are some examples on this slide. The last time we considered in Canada was 17 years ago in a case called Malma Levine which was about the possession of uh, cannabis at the time. And um, the applicants in that case lost. But we can say that a lot has happened in the 17 years to maybe justify a new consideration of this drug law, the drug prohibition. In terms of federal law reform, we have these two bills that I mentioned earlier that were introduced, private members bill by um, the MP Erskine Smith in, in Ontario um, that would also move us towards decriminalization. There's other ways we can do that. We can, um, we can press for a moratoria on enforcement of drug laws. And we've seen that happen in some United, uh, some American cities and states. And that was happened in the context of COVID. Um, we know that there's now with a new directive from the PPSC, there's partial decriminalization. You can, you can argue there's partial decriminalization because, um, because there's some exceptions now made to criminalization in many instances. The health minister under the, the federal drug law could also issue an exemption. There's a section, section 56 of the drug law that exempts, th that is the, the provision that allows supervised consumption services to operate without the threat of criminal prosecution. The health minister could also issue an exemption to everyone in Canada saying, I exempt everyone in the public interest from section four of the drug law. And that would be um, a de facto form of decriminalization. And we, we know that local, meaning municipal or provincial um, governments can also, or bo boards of health or 
uh, medical officers of health could also make a request for an exemption to apply to their city or province. That is within the scope of their authority, their public health authority or their municipal provincial authority. So they could also um, proactively pursue something from the health minister asking for a section 56 exemption. So these are some steps that could be taken for de facto decriminalization. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I will be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. And now we will go up with uh, Jaime, who will talk about uh, the Mexico and decriminalization. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Can you see me? We can see your, yeah, your presentation is good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Exactly two years ago after I attended my first conference on stimulus and it just arrived into Canada and I heard about decriminalization. So I'm going to be presenting to you today, or what I will say, a caution and a tale from Mexico, how not to do things when you're trying to do decriminalization. Uh, a little bit of background, and you can see this in the presentation later on. I work out now for almost 10 years on harm reduction and drug policy, uh, first as a PhD and now also as a professor, but also as a service provision with several organizations in the border. Some context, as you all know, well, Mexico has really been embroiled into this war on drugs. I don't like to use it because I would like to change the narrative about uh, the whole way that we talk about drugs, but it's a popular way to describe it. And basically it's because we're influenced by the position of the United States. If you read the 1971 drug problem message of Congress from Richard Nixon, Mexico is one of the six countries that show up in there because of opium production. You can see here a helicopter from the 70s doing eradication. So it's really the war on drugs and militarization of drugs has been going on for a long time in Mexico. If you see the graph, for example, in the 70s, we used to produce almost 70 or almost close to 90%, I'm sorry, of the herring that will come into the United States will be Mexican. And I'd like to present this uh, graph because it shows kind of like the absurdity of drug policy, which is like after 30 years, we're there again. Like, so probably we should stop doing something because we came back to the same point. And this Mexican word drugs has created uh, beyond incredible violence. And this violence created more after the intervention that President Felipe Calderon started in 2006. Uh, I always tend to say that I worry about causation, but if you see that line after he sent the army to fight the drug cartels, homicides really increase in Mexico. They're more than double. Uh, incarceration crimes are incredibly high. We're, I think, the seventh population, the largest seventh incarcerated population in the world. And there was also a parallel move to try to address substance use. Now, I tried to work in the border of the Mexico and the United States. And this is kind of like a place where see more violence than in other places. So for example, I work both in the city of Tijuana and Mexicali and Tijuana has become one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And unfortunately this combines with a problem of substance use as well. We have, and this is many times reminds me of places in Canada where you have open air drug markets, street injection, ramp and overdose. However, we don't have the resources that you all have into providing naloxone, needle exchange. We have higher numbers of vulnerable populations who like people who inject drugs, homelessness, sex work, deportees, migrants. And this has created like a big problem regarding violence where we have more than a hundred uh, homicides per 100,000, which is incredible for a place that is not at war. We have high HIV rates particularly among people who use drugs that can range between five to 8% depending on gender and other circumstances. And also hepatitis C, which is almost prevalent among everyone who use drugs or inject drugs in the city. we now have higher rates of heroin and now we know fentanyl consumption in the country compared to other places. And also a, a big problem regarding methamphetamine. So what Mexico tried to do? Well, I want to first put that in 1994, there was a big reform where the federal government removed the federal penalty for drugs possession if it was considered for personal consumption. Then there was another effort in 2005 that is similar to what I'll be describing where the Mexican president sent 
uh, initiative to Congress that it was kind of modeled after the Portugal kind of, uh, of, of case study. And it was passed by the Congress, but then uh, President George Bush uh, read the news and said, Mexico is legalizing drugs. He called the Mexican president and the same president who sent this, uh, this initiative uh, video it. Some of the most ridiculous thing. So when a new president came over uh, and also created this war on drugs, they tried to revive this 2009 now known narco menudeo reform or small scale drug possession reform. The idea was that the federal government wanted to only focus on big uh, narco problems, right? Like big trafficking issues. And then we were gonna let the states and the municipalities deal with this small scale drug possession. So for that, uh, there was a change in the law, in the general health law, where we created this table of maximum amounts of drug possession. So several things on this. In one part, the reform is extremely liberal in the sense that it considers all the substances. Uh, you have their opium, heroin, you have cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA. You can even use uh, mushrooms for traditional medicine purposes or peyote. However, and this is one of the problems, the quantities are really small, right? So if you take this table, uh, you can only carry, for example, five grams of marijuana or half a gram of uh, cocaine or one pill of MDMA. But if you have more than that, then you're still considered as a crime and you become prosecuted because now not only they uh, changed the law, but they decided, well, we're gonna prosecute really heavily those people who have the limits beyond this table. They also created something that is a little bit perversive and perhaps it was copied from the United States that is the three strike rule. Meaning if you get caught three times uh, with this table, and you're deemed uh, an addict, that's how they put it under law, an addict, then you had to go to mandatory treatment. So what we have found with the research that we have been done in the border? Well, first is that these reforms can increase police interaction with the street drug users, you know, because the law mandates that you need to take everybody to the public prosecutor so they can wage your drugs. So you're still in the judicial system. And because these personal possessions are really small, they can increase opportunity for corruption. So we have seen, for example, cases being caught in video where the police seats more drugs into you so you are beyond the limit and then it's a crime. But also it diverts police from other high impact crimes. In Tijuana, which is where I have worked more, there's clearly a nearly universal absence of drug user knowledge or experiences of the law. And other researchers like Dan Werf have shown that there's a lack of preparation and coordination between the authorities to implement this reform. We have conducted several analyses. So for example, here we created an analysis of six years of policing statistics where we found that really the law made no change in the behavior of drug possession crimes on the streets of Tijuana, but rather it was electoral times. When there was an election, the mayors decided that it was better to stop arresting people, which is easy to show kind of like a tough on crime stance. So what do we do? we tried to create a, like, a transformation of the policing structure in our community. So through a NIDA police education program, we train almost 2000 police officers in occupational safety and harm reduction education. We had a three hours training where people could check out like the basic epidemiology, law, drug laws, and some elements of harm reduction. The idea was to train the trainers and then also evaluate the training, but follow 800 police officers for two years to see the impact of our implementation and intervention. So we have created a couple of papers that you can consult where we're trying to measure, for example, the knowledge of police officers and what are the best methods to train police officers regarding these issues. And shockingly enough, what we found is that police officers had no idea about the decriminalization law. And this was even more than five years after the law had passed. So for example, you can see here, before the training, less than 9% of the officers knew the limits regarding heroin, uh, also meth and marijuana. After our training, the numbers increased almost to 70%. Still crazy that 20 to 30% of police officers didn't really remember what we just taught them. Uh, but after a couple of months, obviously there's a decrease on, on knowledge. Uh, these have sustained for almost two years, but almost half of the police officers remember the law. 
but that doesn't mean that they implement the law, right? So this is a big problem, how to make police officers not only to know the law, but to follow the law. We also try to align these efforts with public health contents, right? So for example, we measure what was their impression regarding needle exchange programs and the negative uh, opinion went down. We also saw an increase on the role that police officers should have regarding substance use. Uh, they knew now how to refer someone to a rehabilitation uh, program in case they needed it. And also they changed, and I'd like to point this one out dramatically, their view about methadone. Because before the training, they really considered methadone like another drug. You know, like, oh, if you're not quitting drugs, you're just doing another substance. So we're trying to align these efforts. However, the important problem is how to keep this into the long run. And I would like to bring you with this some cautionary tales and lessons from this failed reform. First, budgets are needed. You know, a reform with no money is an empty shell. We can change the law, but if we don't put the money where our words are, then definitely nothing is going to change. Second, the changes are not implemented on their own. We can expect to change the, like the law and the books, but if we don't train the police officers and the other stakeholders who are involved in the reforms, it will be just like another word on a book. It will not be implemented. And also here's really important because when you train police officers, you have to train not only the people who are on the streets, but also the people who are on the top levels of management, because there should be no contradiction to what you're doing on the street with what someone sitting on the desk should be mandated. And because you never know, someone might end up being the chief of police and that might be key for someone to change those preferences of those uh, attitudes over decriminalization into the future. Also important on policing, you need to keep digging and digging and digging. Let's remember that police is a status quo institution and it will take time to change their view and their behaviors. Another one is the devil is in the details. I like this article by Rusonello. You had the chance that compares Mexico and Portugal decriminalization uh, reforms. And those details are, for example, like Sandra has mentioned before, the quantities for personal possession. They need to be realistic. You know, if you put half a gram of cocaine, you know, I have found problems trying to find half a gram of cocaine. So you're going to obviously violate the law. But of all, of all, people with life experience should be involved in the process of determining what are the right quantities for someone to have considered for personal consumption. We should not leave this to bureaucrats sitting in, on, on the desk who believe that, you know, I never use drugs in my life, but I think that people who use drugs, this is what they consume. That's one of the big things that I should uh, pass on to you. The other one, use the health system, not the judicial system. Right now, the reform in Mexico, what it's doing is taking the people in theory from uh, a place of uh, jail, but they still put them through the judicial system that could be a place where they can have the rights violated. They can be still uh, sent out to mandatory treatment and that should not be an option. You know, We know that mandatory treatment doesn't work and even doesn't work if you want to have the proper alternatives to people who wants to stop using. And I want to drill this one. It seems like Sandra and Guillermo and I put the same quotes. Yes, decriminalization is not a silver bullet, but as like economists say, it's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. So I was thinking about this yesterday. It's like, well, it's not a silver bullet, but it still has to be used. We still have the other five bullets. We still need safe supply. We still need increase harm reduction services, we still money, we still have a public opinion. So we need all these elements to make a good way for decriminalization to move forward. And finally, uh, I don't wanna pass the opportunity without pitching out. Uh, these are the projects that I work out in the border. Uh, the only safe consumption site in Latin America, which is in Mexicali, and also the only HIV clinic and harm reduction uh, project in Tijuana. So if you want to support us, I'll leave the links over there. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll be happy to take all your questions.
I was on mute. Sorry, it took me a little while to find my mute button. So thank you very much, Jaime. That was really interesting. I really like that. Uh, we have our, our last uh, speaker the, is Emily. So Emily, you can share your, your screen and then it's your turn to go. All right, thanks, Julie. <laughs> all right can you guys see the screen is this working yep it's working all right so i'm going to talk a bit about the history of substance use and prohibition in canada um, as well as how these laws affect individuals today uh, so drug policy was influenced by international concerns uh, it's also rooted in local history and national history uh, until the 19th century, there was little to no distinction between medical and non-medical uses of opiates. Um, they were consumed by all classes of people, alcohol, tobacco, uh, and opium consumption were embedded in the social customs of Western nations, including Canada. Uh, drug consumption is quite uh, different these or drug consumption is not quite that different these days, honestly, as compared to how it was at the turn of the century, although drug control is quite different. Um, early on, there were few, if any, controls. When white settlers and colonizers came to Turtle Island, which is what's known as North America today, uh, they brought with them their traditional plant-based medicines. Uh, medicines with uh, opium from the poppy plant were effective against pain relief, um, along with uh, a number of other health concerns. Uh, prior to criminalization, these medications were largely consumed uh, in the form of tonics. Um, they were consumed, again, largely by like white women. Uh, they were sold in corner stores and advertised in magazines. Um, Bayers, who we know today as uh, makers of aspirin, actually manufactured and sold heroin at one point. Um, it was kind of advertised as like a catch-all medication for various ailments, including like cold, flus, cough. It was also marketed to children, oddly enough, or to parents of children. Um, in the late 1800s, cannabis tonics became popular and they were being praised by doctors uh, about their healing properties and recommended to their patients. Uh, the coca plant also became popular in patented medicine at this time. And we saw an increase of products containing cocaine become available. Um, one of the most widely known would be Coca-Cola, uh, but there are also cocaine or coca-based toothache medications, uh, medications for hay fever, um, medications for uh, throat troubles, as it was called. Uh, there are even wines that contained cocaine, uh, like Vin Mariani, which was a French tonic wine. And so Canada was envisioned, especially at this time, uh, as a white nation by British colonists. Um, and the Christian middle class regarded sobriety and self-control as uh, not only something to aspire to, but something to hold each other accountable for. <clears throat> uh, indigenous people uh, and later Chinese, Japanese, and South Asians were seen as outsiders to this white nation. The Indian Act of 1868 included a provision that criminalized the sale and consumption of alcohol to status Indians. Uh, this prohibition didn't stop the consumption of alcohol. Uh, instead, it encouraged dangerous drinking practices. Uh, it encouraged illegal consumption and the illegal selling of liquor and thousands of indigenous people were jailed due to these unjust laws. At the same time that indigenous people were being stripped of their rights and their lands, uh, thousands of Chinese workers were being invited to Canada to work on the railway. Canada was a very rural country and the railway was something that the federal government had envisioned as a system to be able to link and unite these white settlements in this newly colonized land. After the railway was completed in the 1800s and many of the workers, uh, the Chinese workers, wound up settling in Victoria and in Vancouver. And that's when we really saw attitudes towards Chinese people start to change and become more extreme, uh, become more racialized. And there was in turn this really large increase in discrimination. Uh, the head tax was created in Canada and there were also limits imposed to stop immigration from China. Mackenzie King, who was uh, the Minister of Labor at that time, was visiting Chinatown in Vancouver 
um, where he learned about the legal opium that was being used here and in Victoria. So upon his return to Ottawa, he wrote a report that recommended the criminalization of crude opium and the smoking of opium. Uh, he didn't recommend that any other forms of opium be criminalized. So forms of opium, uh, the liquid forms that were traditionally being used more by white people um, were not uh, regulated any farther. Um, so really um, white people were kind of exempt from these laws because um, it was the smoking of opium, which was something that traditionally Chinese people were more involved in. Uh, so the report really spoke of like opium dens, um, corrupting white moral Christian men and women. Um, and the Opium Act was created, this narcotic drug law, and it was clearly aimed at Chinese men who were seen as racialized outsiders. Uh, Emily, the, uh, Emily, we're, we're having a little bit problems with your with your camera. Maybe if you turn off your camera, it'll be easier because uh, you're you're cutting out a lot. OK, OK, thank you. Okay. Um, so in 1908, uh, the Opium Act was created. This was Canada's first narcotic drug law, and it was clearly aimed at Chinese men who were seen as racialized outsiders to the Christian nation. The act was strengthened in 1911 when cocaine and morphine were added. Each year, more and more drugs were added to the schedule and the idea of criminalization and drug prohibition became Canada's primary drug strategy at this time. Uh, and this saw a new class of criminals emerge, people who used and sold these criminalized drugs. Incarceration is one of the first harms we think of as a society as a negative result from criminalized substance use. The thousands and thousands of drug possession charges that occur every year in Canada overburden the criminal justice system, causing extensive wait times for trials and hearings, as well as costing taxpayers millions of dollars. The individuals who go through the court systems have their lives changed forever. A person's future prospects become much more grim once they're branded as a criminal. A criminal conviction affects every aspect of a person's life from their ability to gain and maintain employment uh, to their ability to travel or to raise a family, uh, really to have any semblance of a normal life. Uh, today, although many places in Canada utilize uh, some type of harm reduction strategy, we're still feeling the impact of prohibitionist laws and little has changed in terms of how people engage with prohibited substances. The use uh, of illegal drugs often occurs in a clandestine way. Uh, not only is this because the user themselves is seeking secrecy due to a multitude of reasons, including shame and discrimination, and lack of public understanding, as well as incarceration, but often the communities that they live in are further marginalizing them and pushing them back into the shadows. At time, this need for secrecy is so deeply embedded in certain communities that if open drug use occurs, the user can potentially face violent repercussions in retaliation from some of the community members. A not in my backyard approach to substance use as with any approach based on intolerance teaches fear hate and is rooted in an us in them mentality. Drugs and drug use aren't going away. Uh, it's frustrating to me that we haven't learned anything really from the past because we've seen this kind of thing before and we've seen these negative effects before. Uh, when we look at um, alcohol prohibition in the US, for example, we saw that when people couldn't gain access to alcohol from trusted distillers, they made it themselves, uh, sometimes with disastrous consequences. Exploding stills weren't uncommon, and some drinkers were left with blindness that resulted from ingesting methanol, which is a byproduct from improperly distilled wood alcohol. We know that people are going to use drugs and we know that if they can't access a safe form of the substance that they're seeking in a safe way, that they'll likely go with an alternative substance 
in an alternative setting that may be significantly more harmful. The overdose crisis we're facing today <clears throat> was bred from prohibition, with heroin becoming increasingly more pricey and difficult to find Alternatives were needed to meet the demand, and that's where we really saw the introduction of fentanyl, which is an opioid analog to the streets. An analog is a compound having a similar structure to that of another compound, but is differing just enough to be able to circumvent things uh, like narcotic laws. Uh, while fentanyl is a controlled substance, new analogs come out faster than they can be added to the drug schedule list. Another really good example of analogs being used to get around possession and trafficking laws uh, is synthetic cannabis, known as K2 or spice. The overdose crisis was bred from prohibition, but it was born from the criminalization of drugs and drug users. People, uh, who use alone, like I mentioned previously, often do so due to shame and fear of judgment, as well as police involvement, which means uh, they have no one there to respond if there is an emergency. This demographic, uh, people who are using alone, have been disproportionately affected by the overdose crisis. Vancouver often has eyes on it due to the progressive harm reduction approaches that are employed in the city. While drugs are still illegal in Vancouver, <clears throat> the VPD have an unofficial policy that substance use in the downtown east side of Vancouver shouldn't be criminalized. The downtown east side is home to a unique population of substance users, many of whom have been using injection drugs for the majority of their lives. A large amount of this population um, are also homeless and many are living with serious mental health concerns. Sending these folks to jail over and over for possession created a revolving door system that didn't benefit anyone. And thankfully with the implementation of harm reduction services and the support of advocacy groups like Van Du, uh, the police and the city began to understand that this is not a legal problem, but a health issue. Vancouver opened Insight, which is North America's first supervised injection site in 2003. Insight is a physical location where users could visit uh, anonymously, I might add, uh, without having to provide their name or any type of medical information. Um, so like, well, Insight, uh, they don't supply like substances of any kind, uh, they do provide a safe environment where users can inject their drug of choice while being supervised by medical staff. Um, since 2014, when the overdose crisis was declared, there have been a number of safe injection sites and supervised consumption sites that have opened in Vancouver. Uh, and to this day, not one of these sites have experienced an overdose death from a patron while using their facility. The positive impact of harm reduction, of the harm reduction approach is far reaching, but having an unofficial uh, decriminalization of possession stance uh, brings its own hardships. How an interaction will go between a substance user uh, and an officer is defined largely by that officer and not by the law. This creates instances where people are treated extremely differently depending on the, the officer. Um, and their general mood and demeanor that day. In Vancouver, most simple possession charges are later thrown out by the courts, uh, but that doesn't stop a police officer from arresting an individual who's using drugs uh, and booking them and holding them in city cells for the next day or two. Leaving this power up to the police officer uh, as an individual is a slippery slope and is reliant only on the compassion of that individual. Um, so on top of everything else I've already talked about today, we're currently um, in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic that's caused border closures across the world, which has resulted in a significant disruption in the already toxic drug supply. 
Sub substances are being cooked and mixed uh, by those with little to no experience, and in some cases, adulterants such as edizolam or other benzodiazepines are being added to combat lower fentanyl concentrations in the heroin or the down. Uh, these combined substances, uh, opioids and benzodiazepines, have a serious drug interaction and not only greatly increase the chances of an overdose, but also make potential overdose reversal much more challenging. Services like needle exchanges and drop-in sites and life skills centers uh, are running at half capacity and some haven't reopened since COVID hit this spring. Those who are living with substance use disorders in Vancouver, many of whom are homeless and are already dealing with physical health challenges that put them at greater risk of contracting illnesses like COVID are unable to physically distance or isolate due to lack of housing. And for those who do have housing, the severe withdrawal symptoms make it almost impossible to stay inside. Preventing visitors from entering social housing due to COVID-19 is a precaution seen across the country, not only in Vancouver, uh, but all of these aspects together come together to create a perfect storm uh, where we're seeing more individuals using alone, and that's leading to a significant rise in deadly overdoses. British Columbia recorded 147 overdose deaths in August, pushing the death toll to the, in the first eight months of 2020, past the total for all of 2019. This is the highest death toll on record in BC's history. Many, if not all of these deaths were preventable. Access to what's being called safe supply is difficult for many people to gain. And while it's definitely a benefit to some, it's far from a one-size-fits-all solution. More casual or recreational users are finding it difficult to get prescriptions. And on the other side of that coin, individuals who have been using large amounts of fentanyl on a daily basis report that due to their opioid tolerances, they feel little to no effect from the amount of Dilaudid that's being prescribed to them. Uh, similar anecdotes have been reported by those who have gained access to methylphenidate for stimulant use disorder. I do want to say that these are really big steps that the government and regulators have taken and they're steps in the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. Drug prohibition has led to a system that's bulldozed human rights and cost vast sums of money and has created a lot of human misery all in the pursuit of an unattainable goal. After, after years of fighting, it's time to really look at where we are, decriminalize substances and end the war on drugs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emily. That was a really nice big crash course on, on the history of drug prohibition in the last uh, very, very informative. Uh, I Now we will be at the, at the, at the part of uh, questions. So we have a, we, we had had a couple of questions. Uh, Emily, if you want, you can uh, stop sharing your, uh, there we go. Okay. And then we can see all the panelists. Everybody can show themselves. And uh, I think Jessica has a first question. And I think most most of the questions that were there can be answered by most of you, if you if you want. Uh, they'll some be, sometimes be in French, and we'll try to translate it in English. Uh, I think uh, Sophie will do a, a good job. The questions are quite easy. Uh, enough to translate because sometimes they're 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 hard enough. But if somebody starts. I'm sure we'll get into it. And if there is any other questions, I think Jessica has taken care of a, a lot of that. So I will let her ask the first one. Oui, donc nous avions pour commencer une question pour de Jean-Sébastien Fallu qui nous disait le modèle portugais rejoindrait surtout les consommateurs de cannabis dans les grandes villes et demeure moralisateur et punitif. Comment décriminaliser sans stigmatiser, moraliser et punir ici au Canada? Did you guys all get that, or Sophie? Uh, do do you want to come up and maybe say it in uh, without writing it, or are you good? Or is, does everybody get it? Yeah, I don't know. It's maybe easier for the panelists. I don't know. Jessica, peux tu répéter, s'il te plaît? If you can just repeat a little bit slower. I got the first part, but just to make sure. Je peux copier coller aussi dans le chat. Donc vous allez les voir si certains préfèrent le lire. 
donc de Jean-Sébastien Fallu, qui nous disait que le modèle portugais rejoindrait surtout les consommateurs de cannabis dans les grandes villes et demeure moralisateur et punitif. Comment décriminaliser sans stigmatiser, moraliser et punir ici au Canada? So, Guillermo, peut-être tu pourrais commencer. C'était autour de ta, de ta conférence que ça s'est passé. T'es sur mute. <rire> Le, le plus grand défi, c'est de comprendre euh, que euh, tout ce que nous pouvons dire ne s'applique pas de pareille façon à toutes les classes sociales. Parler des classes sociales peut sembler un peu ringard, ce n'est pas à la mode, mais elles sont très visibles en matière de prévention et de consommation des drogues. Comme le signalait, j'insiste, de façon très juste, Marie-Andrée Bertrand, déjà à la fin des années 60, lorsqu'elle a donné des avis en dissidence au sein de la commission Lédin. Le problème de l'infantilisation euh, traverse toutes les professions, mais va vers le bas, c'est-à-dire les experts médicaux, tous les intervenants l'appliquent vers des gens qui ne sont pas dans sa classe sociale. Il y a ce problème d'infantilisation que l'on voit partout, et c'est pourquoi on n'ose pas prendre des mesures qui font appel à la responsabilité et aux droits citoyens de tout le monde, incluant les consommateurs. C'est par exemple un problème majeur que nous n'osons même pas nous poser la question sur la distribution contrôlée, la fa facilité, l'accès aux opiacés en pleine crise, crise du fentanyl, en pleine crise des surdoses. Ça, c'est un problème, c'est une, une des mesures de nos difficultés et Jean-Sébastien fait très bien de le signaler. Tous les modèles et le modèle portugais et les autres modèles de décriminalisation peuvent nous sembler moralisateurs, mais il faut euh, également tenir compte de la dimension culturelle qui parfois nous échappe un peu. Mais c'est surtout la question des classes sociales, je pense, qui est la plus difficile à aborder. Comme le disait, j'insiste, Marie-Andrée Bertrand, car euh, les consommateurs qui ont accès à, facilement à des recours médicaux et sanitaires peuvent consommer les produits de substitution de leur choix comme ils le veulent et sans grand problème et surtout pas avec des problèmes avec la police et la justice. Donc, la première dimension à tenir en ligne de compte, c'est celle des classes sociales et euh, de nous poser les questions sur nos impossibilités pour penser que tout le monde peut être responsable, même s'il est consommateur. Merci, Guillermo. Does anybody else want to react to that? So it's, it's regarding decriminalization. Uh, how do we decriminalize without stigmatizing, moral, moralizing or punishing uh, people in Canada? So go, Sandra. Yeah, I would just like to maybe add that I think any decriminalization model needs to be done with the full leadership and consultation, meaningful consultation of people who use drugs. And I think they need to, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think any model, including we talked about thresholds at some point and, and what a threshold means when you have it too low in a case like Russia or in, in, in Mexico, like you need people who use drugs. They are the experts in terms of drug consumption. What is what is the harms of drug prohibition in their lives, they need to determine the process. And I think that will mitigate some of the concerns about moralization, stigmatization. Awesome. Does anybody else want to react to that? Jaime? Yes, I want to second what Guillermo was saying, right? We need to see those structural things like inequalities in income and classes and social classes, because it's easy, let's say, let's take the marijuana case, for example, in Mexico where we are pursuing like the full legalization of the market. But then once we achieve it, are we cool? Like we only care about what the substances that we use, but what about the other substances that people who might be in a different condition than us, uh, what do we happen to them? So we, we need to have a huge basket, you know, like all drug users are the same. We should not decriminalize among ourselves. Like these are good ones versus the other ones, you know? And that's something that I think we need to start doing on our own. If we want to end up the stigma, 
uh, recreational drug users need to stop addressing other drug users about like, oh my God, I will never use that drug. Let's stop that message, you know? Like anyone is using the drugs that they want. And that's the first step that we need to take in order to change. We need to change our own stigmas as well. Thank you. Emily, did you want to react to that? Um, I think that really it's kind of all been said at this point. I really, really agree with what Jaime said, though, about um, kind of the, the internalized issues that go on between substance users um, and the discrimination that we put towards each other based on our chosen substance and our view of the substance that other people are using. Um, so I think that it is really important to look at that, that there's change needed um, on every level from every group of individuals, um, from every kind of class system, right? Uh, it's not just convincing or changing the minds of people that are up high who are creating the policy and making the decisions. It's also how we're treating each other here down on the ground on the floor. Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. There was another question that I really th thought that was interesting from Sean Bristow. He says, I'm wondering, given the current discussions on police abolition, how do you think policies should honor that eventual goal change in society? For example, instead of police, who should, who should put into practice these proposed diversion pro pro programs or if there are is those types of programs put in place. Go Jaime. I'll, I'll tackle that one first. Uh, you know, I, I, I found working with police, it can be difficult, right? And many people will not want to work with police. I have a saying that is, if they are part of the problem, they should be part of the solution. So one part of the solution should be, maybe they should not be involved in certain activities. And I put up in the, in the on the message there that there's a program, for example, in the United States that is called Lead Law Enforcement Assisted Division, uh, where what they do is they pair police officers with local organizations who act as social workers who can then link the people to the necessary services. You know, I also think that we put police officers to do work that they should not be doing. So uh, that's something that we should consider how to pair local community organization in tasks that police should not be involved with. Does anybody else want to react to that? Go, Guillermo. C'est tout à fait vrai ce qu'il dit, mais et ce qu'on a travaillé dans des pays du tiers monde ou sous-développés, peu importe, avec les, les policiers, on a saisi très rapidement que les policiers ont parfaitement un double discours sur les drogues, un discours public et un discours un privé qui est beaucoup plus tolérant parfois, et c'est surprenant, que ce discours privé que celui des médecins, par exemple, ou d'autres intervenants en santé. Euh, donc la police euh, peut s'adapter à mieux travailler, à travailler autrement et certainement euh, ça va euh, d'ailleurs dans beaucoup de pays, ce n'est pas le cas du Canada heureusement, et ça diminue énormément les, les possibilités de corruption comme Jaime l'a très bien signalé dans sa, dans sa présentation. Mais euh, j'insiste sur ça, c'est-à-dire c'est surprenant quand on travaille de près avec la police Beaucoup de, de membres de corps policiers sont plus tolérants que beaucoup d'autres intervenants. Et euh, on le voit aussi, euh, dès qu'ils peuvent parler, dès qu'ils se sont retirés des forces, beaucoup d'anciens commissaires et autres euh, policiers sont en faveur de la légalisation et de la décriminalisation. Euh, C'est une, une, une manière de... On ne va pas faire disparaître la police du jour au lendemain dans nos sociétés. Euh, peu importe le type de rêve anarchiste qu'on peut couver, euh, ce ne sera pas euh, un claquant des doigts. Donc le mieux, c'est de penser comment on peut euh, les faire collaborer euh, dans un cadre plus vaste. Merci, euh, Guillermo. Est-ce que, Sandra, go for it. I, yeah, I just want to um, underscore that I don't think police have any role to play in health diversion. And so maybe that's, I don't share the opinion with the, the well, police, I don't see them collaborating as a, a health diverter or with social services. I think because the experience of so many marginalized communities is so 
it's it's so traumatic to be experienced police, they, they shouldn't have a role to play. And so I strongly disagree with the CACP recommendations that police will still continue to be a frontline diversion mechanism. I think they should be removed from the equation altogether, other than informing them of the new law and ensuring they uphold the law. Um, and there should be mechanisms to ensure that there's no abuse of this. If there is law reform, there should be no abuse of that, but I don't think they should play any role in diversion. Good comments. Uh, go, Emily. Uh, yeah, I agree with Sandra that um, I don't think that the police should be playing a part at this point. I think they need to be taking a step back. Um, they've been at the forefront of these, you know, um, community engagements and involvements for so long um, that I don't think it's something we need to continue with. Uh, I really feel that um, grassroots organizations, social services, and most importantly, people who are using drugs, individuals that are really affected and know what's going on, should have an input in helping to create and inform these new policies and decisions. Absolutely. Jessica, do you have an, another question uh, that you would like to ask about? It's my turn to have my phone. We are on mute. <laughs> it's going to be our thing, huh? You're on mute. Nous avons beaucoup de questions qui ont été posées. Je vais y aller avec une question en français de Louis Turcotte qui demandait au premier panéliste, Guillermo, s'il est possible de nous en dire un peu plus sur les aspects de liens sociaux qui ont été développés au Portugal. Donc, de quoi s'agit-il au juste, les approches stratégies utilisées? On a fait, pour simplifier la chose, on, les gens qui sont d'une manière ou d'une autre interpellés par la police euh, vont aller dans un... vont devoir rencontrer des intervenants qui ne sont pas tout à fait dans le système judiciaire, ni des membres de la police, mais plutôt dans les services sociaux et la santé. Et pour simplifier encore, vont avoir une sorte de euh, pacte de, 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 de pacte d'intervention pour pouvoir gérer euh, les, les semaines et les mois à venir avec une aide des euh, pays et des, des, des services sociaux. Ça fonctionne plutôt bien. Bien sûr, il y a toujours des anicroches, mais pour les pays sous-développés, c'est vraiment un système dont on peut rêver seulement, même si le Portugal n'est pas le pays le plus riche de l'Europe. Quand même, il y a des ressources substantielles. Quand on compare avec la situation des, des toxicomanes ailleurs dans le monde, dans les pays sous-développés, c'est vraiment une, une situation qui qui permet aussi de les rapprocher du monde du travail, de, de se reconstituer. Merci, Guillermo. Est-ce qu'il y avait une petite question, celle-là? Je pense qu'elles ont été répondues. I'm trying to look for... Uh, I'm sorry. Je pourrais... Vas-y, vas-y, oui. La question de Liam, qui est... Oui, vas-y, c'est ça que j'allais. Vous je, je, de... je, je vais la lire, c'est ça, hein? c'est la question de Exactement. Liam. So, what, OK, so Liam Michaud, uh, question for Sandra. Wondering if you could elaborate on what the PPSC guidelines, directives, do they remove prosecutorial discretion in pursuing charges for simple possession entirely, what jurisdiction it applies to? Does it represent a shift from custodial to conditional sentencing or remove possibility of criminal charges entirely? It's a big question. There's a lot of words. Sorry for my English. There's a lot of words there that, were, that, that, that I, I struggled with. Did you get, did you understand it? Yes, you it see is, it? Yeah, thank Are you. you. Okay. Thanks, Liam. Um, so the direct, I called it a directive. I, I misspoke. It's a, it's a guideline. So it's not a binding, it's guiding principles for prosecutors across the country. It applies across Canada, except for Quebec and New Brunswick, uh, where the prosecutors in those provinces only would be, be guided by this um, guideline if the RCMP uh, pursues the offense, the charges. So um, it mostly applies across Canada, but for those two provinces, with the exception of RCMP offense uh, charges. And it, um, it's supposed to guide the prosecutors, but they also, they still maintain obviously some discretion. So the idea is that it shifts people away from um, not so much um, sentencing because it, it, it stops them from even pursuing those charges in the first place. 
So they say it, it doesn't, none of the serious manifestations of harm are present, like the children um, uh, using when you're in jail, like the, in, in those bullet points I had in my slide, um, then there shouldn't, they shouldn't even pursue those charges. So it would be removing from the equation, the idea of even being going to court um, being found uh, guilty and convicted and serving a sentence. I can, I'm gonna pop the, guideline, the guidelines in the chat so you can see for yourself what, what they say. Thank you, uh, Sandra, for that. There's a good question here by Jeremy Cal Calicium. He said, provided that Canada moved to a decriminalization model, what is the risk of subsequent hostile governments removing this progressive step? What can we do to prevent this? So maybe any of you can maybe respond to that question, which is, <laughs> uh, the, go for it, Guillermo. Il faut d'abord la décriminalisation. <laughs> <laughs> C'est une bonne question. Un peu trop loin dans le temps, peut-être, pour y répondre. Yeah. It's, I go for it, uh, Jaime. No, I think, uh, I mean, if we had that answer, like, we can retire, right? I, I mean, it's complicated in the sense, let's, let's take the, the perfect case with insight, right? So, there were so, these changes are natural. Like, let's take the case of the United States where people thought that Obama, certain things advanced in the criminal justice system and then a completely different government comes in and takes it over. It's always a risk, right? But that should never stop us to take the first step. It's better if we make those wins and then they fight so they don't take them back than if we try to you know, say like, well, what will happen in the future? So I'll just say like, let's fight for those steps and then we'll just dig in and make an effort there so they don't take them out. The rights that once they're given are much more difficult to take. I see Sandra wanted to react to that. Uh. Yeah, so I just I was just saying, like, I think the more we normalize and entrench either uh, de jure or de facto decriminalization, so we either we go through law reform where we repeal the law and also entrench it in police practice, for instance, maybe there's this direct this directive becomes normalized and prosecutors just stop pursuing in, in tandem with law reform, in tandem with maybe exemptions to municipalities or provinces, when all that becomes normalized, just like with the supervised consumption services, we had two, what, five years ago, now we have 39 or 40. And it's really hard to pull back once we have it, like we see the sky hasn't fallen. So I think multiple facets of advocacy and, and doing it in different pockets, federally, locally, provincially, um, would make it harder for subsequent governments to try to change things, especially if we see a savings to the criminal justice line. Absolutely, yes. So there are, yes, yeah, uh, Emily, like go, uh, or, uh, go ahead, go ahead Emily, first. I think Emily okay. wanted, no, are you, yeah, are you good? No, no, I was just going to agree, and I was also kind of um, branching off of what Sandra said. I think that um, having solid research is really important, and being able to not only show, like, anecdotally within the community that these things are working, but to actually be able to show, uh, like, on paper and black and white, where the benefits are and that, that savings, you know? So I think that will make a really big difference in terms of yeah, being able to pull it back and uh, the, the like uh, ethical dilemmas and the ethical like issues around retracting something like that once it's already been uh, laid out and created in law. Yeah, totally. We do have a comment though of Sean Bristow and I would like to point it out because it is a good one. It's Alberta is incredibly hostile and we are losing our CS, our, our services and everything like that. So we do have to say that it is a possibility even though to also lose those kind of things that we have gained. We do have to recognize that. I have a good question here, which always comes up because of the decrim against the legalization of all drugs and things. But I think uh, uh, I'll say it in French because it was it was uh, said by Michel Lalancette, and it says le marché noir est, est, la, est la pire entité pour fournir les psychotropes qualité prix et tout ça. Pourquoi ne pas la pas légaliser? Hein? So why not legalize drugs since <laughs> the market is so bad and the quality of drugs is so bad. Uh, why are we going first for decrim? Like we have this question, it comes up a lot. Why decrim and not totally just go for legalization of all drugs? I think that's a good question to finish up on. And I would like to hear you guys on that because it's it's one of those things we, we struggle with. Sandra? I can jump in quickly. I, I, think, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you, you can have both and they're both really important. Um, important for getting 
uh, ensuring people have access to non-toxic substances. And also important that we see that with legalization, with cannabis, for instance, there's still people who are being criminalized. So you can't, I think, you having one without the other is it sort of presents sort of a false dichotomy. We, we need both, I think, to ensure the health, safety, and dignity of people who use drugs. Um, and I think they can work in tandem. I don't know that um, we're, we're trying to. Scott's saying we actually need both. Yeah, we need yeah. both. I agree. <laughs> yes. I think Emily wanted to react to that too. Yeah, I, I also think that we need both. Um, but I think that in some situations, like when you look at cannabis and you look at, yes, it is legal um, and what's available through the legal market uh, is incredibly expensive. Um, and the quality is sometimes is good, but sometimes is still so so. And a lot of the compassion clubs that are operating in a legal gray market are actually supplying uh, more of the high quality cannabis, at least within British Columbia. And I feel like this kind of extends across Canada. Um, so I think that uh, decriminalization allows for uh, a compassion club model or similar models to kind of come into place. Um, and I think that if we did have decriminalization and we didn't have um, so many concerns about people trying to access substances and are possessing substances, uh, I think that, you know, more time and more thought uh, would be put into things. And I think that we wouldn't be so concerned, um, you know, with trying to, one of the things that I think is really uh, comes out of decriminalization, or sorry, it comes out of um, criminalization is we wind up trying to uh, access drugs that are stronger and more potent, you know, so we can carry smaller amounts of them on us, right? Um, so if we're not looking at those kind of um, negative impacts from doing things like that, I think that people will want to access clean drugs, right? We're People who access drugs right now are demanding clean drugs. We want clean drugs. Um, so I don't think that, um, you know, that will be too far off in the future uh, if decriminalization does come to fruition. Thank you for that, Emily. Uh, does Guillermo or Jaime want to say something? Go I mean, it, I, agree, I agree with them, right? It's, <laughs> it's a false dilemma, right? Like sometimes I think we, in drug policy, we are faced with false dilemmas, you know? Like we don't have to choose one or the other one. It's like, oh my God, either you give this one and then you give the other one away. No, we should be ambitious and try to get them all, right? Yes, thank you, Jaime. And so, uh, do we have any other questions, Jessica, or I think we went through all of them. Uh, I would like maybe for you guys all to maybe say a last little word or, or something that you would like to finish up with or something you said, and then I'll, I'll have a couple of little uh, things uh, for the next steps. Uh, uh, we will be putting an evaluation in the in the. Um, in the, the chat, uh, we will be sending it off to you guys also. But if you have a couple of minutes before the next meeting you're going to, because I know everybody's going to the next meeting for sure. But if you have a little bit of time, it would be lovely because it would really help us a lot on that side. So I'm going to let uh, each of the speakers uh, uh, say a little word before uh, we, we, we run off. Je commence. Vas-y, oh. Guillermo. <laughs> Alors, juste pour dire que la décriminalisation, c'est juste une éventuelle, éventuelle première étape et que ce serait souhaitable de pouvoir cesser d'infantiliser et redonner juste ses droits citoyens à chacun pour décider ce qu'il peut veut consommer en toute légalité et de manière absolument claire et sans anicroche, c'est-à-dire sans contaminants, sans intoxicants et en étant entièrement responsable de ce que la personne fait ou ne fait pas, que ce soit un choix libre et éclairé. On est loin de là, car ceux qui peuvent prendre des décisions portent en eux et en elles beaucoup, beaucoup de préjugés qui sont très, très difficiles à élimer un temps soit peu. Ah, merci pour ces beaux mots, c'est vrai. Euh, Sandra yeah, maybe my final word is that I, I think it would be amazing to have all these health and social support services that we, we, we have been talking about that are really important to have in tandem with decrim, but I don't think it, I, I hope that we can move forward with decrim. Um, even now, today, we could do it without any of these health and social support services, although they'd be great. I, I don't want that because I keep hearing Minister Trudeau saying it's not a silver bullet, it's not a silver bullet, and I hope that's not used as an excuse to hold up what we can do is long overdue. Absolutely. 
Jaime? Yeah, thank you uh, for this lovely talk. Uh, I think since I've made Canada my second home, I've heard a lot about decriminalization and at some moment, some people say like, this is just decriminalization. What is the word? What is, what are the details behind it that we need to pay attention because you have one chance to do it right from the beginning. We don't want to have a decriminalization and then being like, oh, damn, there were so many unintended consequences that we never thought about it. How do we solve it? So if you have, it's not a silver bullet, but you want to have a perfect bullet when you use it. So if you're going to use it, then take some of the cautionary tales that I've had passed on through the fell uh, decriminalization that we did down south here. And let's push it forward. I think it's, it's, it's time. I've, I think the community needs it. Uh, now with all these problems that uh, the COVID and the regular supply is that we need to double the most to make this change happen. Yes, uh, and uh, we will finish with Emily and I'll give you a couple of little informations just before we all leave. Oops, is Emily uh, frozen? No, no, she's there. Yes. I was frozen, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> seem to have a pretty poor internet connection. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, so I guess in all in all, like, I don't know. I feel like it is really important to, to acknowledge the steps that we've made. Uh, the legalization of cannabis is great. You know, the movements with uh, harm reduction and social supports, like, we're moving in a good direction. Um, but it's really important that we don't stop. It's really important that we keep pushing forward. Um, even with the approaches that we have, uh, people are dying. And especially now with COVID and the closures of the borders and the uh, increasingly uh, toxic drug supply that we have, people are dying. These are our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our uncles, our aunts. Like we need to step up and we need to uh, enact some change. Absolutely. So I want to really thank you all. You guys were lovely. It was an amazing. It went super well too. Not too much, uh, not too much uh, problems with the internet and everything. And your talks were really inspiring. I hope it inspired many of you to go back to your communities and think about it and bring back and, and things like that. And we will necessarily do more webinars. There'll be more the themes like this, there's four, three other ones. We haven't decided on all the themes yet, but they're coming up. And we have a Stimulus Connect next week. I think Shay has already shared it in there and it's on defunding the police. Um, and we'll have a whole bunch of people talking around that subject. So if people are interested in that, go to the website. The Stimulus website has all the webinars, the connects, the hang, whatever we do. Uh, everything is there. Uh, Jessica put the evaluation in the, the chat also, but we will be going back. We will sending. We will send you an email and the this uh, this recording and all the powerpoints and all the the uh, all the different information of everybody that was talking today will be on the website. So you guys will be able to connect with the people that have talked. So thank you all of you for being there, asking all these wonderful questions, and I hope you guys enjoyed your couple of hours that you had with us. And we even finished a little bit before time, which is. Wow, incredible. <laughs> so uh, take care, everybody. And the, the other people, if you can stay, the, the, the panelists, if you can stay a little bit longer. But uh, have a good day. See you soon. <laughs>